This evening, uh, we're going to be blessed by a local Hyphalonian, John Cox, who's been here for 20 years and actually runs his own cooperage. And he's going to give us the long history of the art of barrel making. It's very fascinating. But anyway, John Cox, everyone. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, everybody. Hi. Uh, my name is John Cox. Uh, I'm a cooper. I have a cooperage here in High Falls. Uh, before I start, I just want to thank Bill and Dave and Bill's crew. Isn't this place beautiful? Have you guys been here yet? You did a great job. Let's hear it for the DH Canal guys. It's a great addition to the town, and, and I'm so proud to talk here tonight. Thanks, Bill. Uh, this is my company, Quercus, and uh, I make barrels and tanks uh, right up in the uh, Mohonk Arts Building. Many of you know. We're putting the fun back in super fund up there. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And uh, uh, the coopering is one of the ancient trades. Uh, the sawyers sawed, the millers milled, and the coopers uh, made cooper joinery to hold water and other goods. Uh, we see it all throughout the world. We see it in Japan. We see it in uh, Europe um, and South America. Uh, the coopers would make uh, the vessels. There are three different types of coopers. There's the wet cooper, uh, which is what I do. I hold liquid. Uh, we have the dry cooper who makes slack barrels. You would see like Rosendale cement in a slack barrel cooperage. There's also the white cooper, and they made all the culinary uh, instruments you would need. There would have been a white cooper right here in town, so if you needed a bowl or a bucket or a spoon or a ladle, uh, you would go to your white cooper for that. Uh, the barrels, we're going to talk today about barrels and tanks, and the barrels have a wonderful lexography to them. Uh, not only their names, uh, but our lexicon has so many words derived from the barrel and the tank, and we're going to talk about those today. You can see some of them here. This is the ton. The French barrel, the ton, is where we get the term ton. In fact, we still measure oil in tons and barrels. Uh, we see the butt here, and that is where we get the word butt. Uh, that's where it is. Uh, it doesn't really look like a butt, but all of you on that barrel have a bunghole right in the middle. That's right. That is called that. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, we have the puncheon, the hoghead, the tears, the barrel, the rundlet, uh, there's a kilnderkin, the firkin, which is what I make, a little bit larger than this, and the pin. Uh, the firkin is Dutch for quarter. It's a quarter of a barrel, and the pin is a half of a firkin, half of a quart, and that's where we get the terms quart and pint uh, from these small barrels. Our ancestors used barrels and tanks for everything. Without it, they wouldn't have been able to live, drink, eat, explore, conquer, warfare, colonization, industrialization. It all relied heavily and on the tank and the barrel. I'm going to talk about that in my talk today. For the first half and the second half, I'm going to talk to you about the process of how I make uh, coopered vessels uh, up at the shop. Coopering is the, is the art of making a polygon using different pieces. This is a four-sided polygon here, this square. And uh, Cooper joinery relies on Oh, I had my, uh, these angles here. So uh, this is four pieces. If I put four pieces into a circle of 360, if I divide four into 360, I get 90 degrees. I can make a four-sided polygon using 90-degree cuts with two small pieces and two larger pieces. If I take that number and I divide by two, I get 45. So if I want to make a four-sided shape, I cut 45-degree angles there. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Uh, so what's that? So uh, 4 into 360 divided by 2 is a very rudimentary formula. Uh, and you have Cooper joinery all over your house where you have picture frames here. This is a uh, six-sided, and a 6 into 360 divided by 2 would give us a 30-degree angle. If we extrapolate that through barrels and tanks, this barrel has 25 staves. If I divide 25 into 360 and divide by 2, I get the angle. This frame is not going to work if the angle is 42 degrees. It's not going to work if it's 46 degrees. You can see here how tight the staves are. With most coopers, there's no glue or screws. And you can see how tight the seam is here on the staves. This is a barrel stave. 
Stave is plural for staff, same way leaves are plural for leaf. Our ancestors used to keep animals at bay with a stick. We still call that staving off. We stave off infection. We stave off bankruptcy uh, by holding a stick at it. <laughs> <laughs> Cooper joinery is more than just barrels. Uh, here we see water towers on the Upper West Side, hot tubs, silos. This was brought to my attention by my dear friend Dick Stokes early on in my research. Uh, Dick pointed out that the silos were very much similar to the barrel and led me down making the tanks that I make. Thanks, Dick. This is a glue up for a column. You can see here the staves. There's 25 staves here glued up. This would be put on a lathe and turned uh, into a column right there. So coopering is used in many different facets of woodworking. This is a small uh, rudimentary barrel. Uh, this is called the piggin, and this would be used on uh, get collecting maple syrup. I believe that's from like the 13th century. You can see the wooden bands, and I'll talk to you about those a little bit more. You can see this handle. The one stave would have an extended handle to hold it. Uh, these are very small, uh, but there are very large barrels and tanks. The, uh, this is in France. This is one of the largest uh, barrels in the world. Uh, you can see, similar to a silo, uh, the rings holding it. And there's a person there just to give you an idea of how large that is. So the history of the barrel goes all the way back to Julius Caesar, the Roman Empire. As they're marching across and defeating the Gauls, they come across uh, these simple iron barrels. They were dragging wine across there in these clay amphoras. You can see this little nipple here that, that would go into the sand. And the soldiers needed wine, so they would drag these amphora across. But like I said, when they met the Gauls and usurped them, they realized and used the technology of barrel making. We see it in here. By the second century, the Romans are using barrels. And this is um, from 300 AD, 220 or something. These are, uh, as I talked about before, without barrels, we wouldn't have exploration or any kind of nautical warfare. They needed potable water. They needed food on the boat. Uh, and these simple rudimentary barrels were pulled out of a, a Viking ship that they found. They were in pretty good shape. Caesar and the Roman Empire uh, uh, leave the French area, but they introduce wine and uh, grapes to the Bordeaux region. Uh, and the winemaking continued to make there. We see this. Uh, these are some large butts right here. As you can see in the barrel, the, there's wooden spikes there, what was called the spig. It's where we get the term spigot. In French, it was a fossé. It's where we get the term faucet. And it was very important and very difficult to retrieve water and liquid from the barrel and be able to close it back up again. Large barrels like this were kept only by lords and aristocracy, and they would be kept in the buttery. Uh, this would usually be in the basement or in a separate building. The butts were kept here in the buttery. And the one important person to the Lord was the man who could go down and retrieve wine and port from the butts. And that man became known as the butler. <laughs> By Elizabethan times, we see that he's head of household, but that's where the term originates. The same thing is happening in the East. Uh, we see uh, in Japan, they're making small tanks and barrels here. Uh, Hokusai, who we know from the wave illustration, that was from his Mount Fiji series. And you can see Fiji uh, in the middle of the barrel there. And this gentleman here uh, making a large cask. They don't use steel or wood. They use braided bamboo that they split and weave into a braid. And uh, it's almost like a steel cable at that point. You can see how large the mallets are there that they are hammering them down with. This is the Battle of Orleans. This is about the 14th century. This de depiction here is the first time we see a cannon being used in warfare. The cannons, uh, the metallurgy at the time did not allow them to cast uh, metal pipes. So they would use metal staves and line the outside with steel. Like this small, these are called bombasts. And you can see the staves here. And we still use that as the barrel of a gun. And that's where that term comes from, the barrel. This brings us to Johannes Kepler. Uh, he was one of the first astronomers. He was the first to separate astrology and astronomy. 
Uh, he's known as the father of calculus. And one of those reasons is from this book that he wrote, the Nova Sterometria Dolorium Viniorium, or the New Geometry of the Wine Barrel. <laughs> During Kepler's second marriage at the end when he was paying the wine merchant, he felt like he was getting ripped off. Kepler asked the man how he measured the barrel, and when the man showed him that he put two sticks in it, Kepler couldn't believe that that's how he measured it. So being a student of Archimedes, uh, he decided, he figured out how to find the volume and interior of a barrel. And from this we see the birth of calculus. Measuring barrels is something our ancestors went through and were troubled with for hundreds of years. If I told you this was six gallons or if I told you it was four gallons, you have no way to really know. And I can rip you off if I sold you four gallons of beer or six gallons of beer in a four gallon barrel. So it was very hard for merchants and uh, other people, especially who wanted to excise tax on these products, to figure out how much volume was in these barrels. This brings us to the age of discovery and nautical exploration and trade. Relied heavily on the barrel. Uh, this is a picture from uh, the Dutch Trading Company. You can see how the boats were made flat so they could roll the barrel onto them. Most barrels uh, were sent down in stacks of sta uh, staves that was used as a ballast. And then the barrels would be constructed by the coopers right there on the beachhead and filled. The barrels would be rolled into those boats and then brought out uh, to the main ships. We can see here more flat barrel. This is called a Durham boat and it was used to move the barrels around. Here we are at the Mayflower. Uh, you can see a cross section of it. There was barrels of food. Um, there was barrels of water. If this was a warship, there would also be barrels of gunpowder. Uh, without barrels, they wouldn't be able to survive. Nautical law said that ships couldn't sail without a cooper, and the Mayflower was three weeks late leaving because they didn't have a cooper on board. They finally found a young man by the name of John Alden. There he is there. He's America's first cooper. He's also one of the longest living uh, Mayflower residents. Uh, some of his ancestors include Orson Welles, Marilyn Monroe, Longfellow, Adams, Dick Van Dyke. Without the Cooper, we wouldn't have Mary Poppins, Citizen Kane, and uh, <laughs> Marilyn Monroe. This brings us to the Jamestown settlement. In 1604, we see records that they were using pipe staves. They were using pipe staves to irrigate water off of the James River. Here's a very rudimentary stave pipe. You can see the pieces there. Sometimes they were actually uh, whole logs that had been holed through. These stave pipes were very important uh, as we explored west. Uh, we needed to bring water to areas we couldn't get to. Uh, so men would build large stave pipes. It's very similar to a silo. It's just on its side. You can see there the staves are being staggered as they build. It was easy for a burrow or a mule to bring this wood up onto a hill so they could build these pipes and bring water where they needed. You can see here, as my friend Dick pointed out, that the, the silos and wooden staves are held with what's called an Allen shoe. They also call it a lug. This allowed them to tighten the staves. And if you drive by an old silo, you'll see these in a water tower. This brings us to Aaron Burr, sir. Uh, Burr was commissioned uh, to start the Manhattan Company, and the Manhattan Company was made to help fight yellow fever and to put better water pipes in New York City. He did this with Hamilton. Uh, they were partners at the time with the Manhattan Company. Uh, there was, a, there was a, a byline in the charter that the Manhattan Company could start its own business if it wanted or any enterprises, and Burr started uh, the Manhattan Bank. Uh, this caused a schism between him and Hamilton, one that they never uh, were able to make up on. Uh, the Manhattan Bank uh, still survives. It became the Manhattan Chase Bank, uh, became the J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, and now it's just the Chase Bank. Uh, does anybody here bank with Chase? You do? Uh, in your pocket is a debit card, and on that debit card is the Chase logo, and it's a stylized wooden pipe. Uh, that they harken back to their origins? and Aaron Burr. I want to talk about some of the industries that relied on barrels. One of them was the naval stores industry. There were no stores per se. It was more about storage. 
and boats in the 17th and 18th century couldn't sail. There was no epoxy, there was no glue, there was no paint, so they relied on resins and oils from long-needled pines. This would be refined in large wooden tanks and boiled down. There's some tar barrels here. England was having a problem. They were having a problem with Palatine Germans, and they were having a problem because Russia cut them off from the pine and tar that they needed. Queen Anne sent 20 ships up the Hudson uh, to where the Livingstons lived to try to harvest those trees to get resin. They also sent 20 ships down to North Carolina. Uh, the trees here at Claremont, where they had the work camp, were not the right trees. Those Germans settled nearby in what we now know as Germantown. In North Carolina, it was the right tar, and there was quite a business down there uh, of making tar, and we still call them the North Carolina Tar Heels, and it's from this naval stores industry. It's one of the early seals of New York. It shows how important the barrel was. We see a Dutch trader. We see an Indian. Uh, the pelts that were used, the beaver pelts, and then two barrels right there. This brings us back to Jamestown, excuse me, the tobacco industry. By 1619, uh, tobacco was thriving in Jamestown, and they're relying heavily on two things. They're relying on the barrel and chattel slavery. For the next 300 years, those two items would be intertwined through American colonization and industry. Uh, you can learn more about that in the 1619 Project, if anybody's interested or, or has heard about it. Uh, all the industries that I show relied heavily on both of those items. They were traded and shipped the same way, side by side, in the bottom of a dank boat. And it was part of a triangle of trade that included slavery, barrels, and molasses from the Caribbean to Africa uh, to here in America. You can see here the tobacco was packed in these large hogsheads. This is tobacco that would have came out of them that was stacked in there. The hog heads could also have an axle be put through it and can be rolled up by horse, as you can see there. This is a paper making tub. Uh, this was a lithograph, I think from the 17th century that somebody brought me. He was a paper maker and he had me make him a, uh, a paper making. He makes frames of pulp in there uh, to make paper. This is a cross section of Captain Cook's boat. Uh, do I have my glasses? Sorry. Uh, at this point, while well, uh, Captain Cook, over two million men had died from scurvy. Sailors were, sailors were riddled with scurvy. You can see here they were even afraid. They didn't know what was going on, and they were afraid to even go to land. And uh, they would have people bring them buckets and barrels of fruit. By the 1800s, they realized that it's citrus that the men need. Um, and one common place to get that if they were in the Mediterranean was the island of Sicily. In 1837, they had 740 barrels. By 1850, it explodes to 20,000 barrels of lemons were coming out of Seattle. The Sicilian farmers were overwhelmed by this. They were getting robbed. They needed protection. They needed help with distribution. And they hired local soldiers to help them with this, local mafi. Uh, these mafi helped them to protect and distribute it. Uh, we see them a few years later moving here to America, to big cities like Boston, New York, Rhode Island, Philadelphia. My Sicilian ancestors landed, and they brought those skills that they had with them uh, here to the States. And, uh, but we can thank the Barrels of Lemons for the birth of the Sicilian mafia. This brings us to the whaling industry. As you can see there on the bottom, the barrels the coopers are filling the barrels. The blubber is being melted right there in a ton and brought down and filled into the barrel. The men had to be very careful. If they bung the barrel too quick, the pressure and heated oil inside would explode, scalding everyone nearby. There's some barrels of whaling oil. Uh, this is from the USS Constitution. Uh, men on boats then didn't have individual water, so they all had to go to the same place to get the water. Uh, it would be a large barrel like this that we know as a butt. In nautical terms, to make a hole in something is called to scuttle it. Uh, so the men would meet around the scuttled butt, talk about the captain and the chef, and that's where we get is the original water cooler. So next time you hear somebody say, what's all the scuttle butt? Uh, it's from them gathering around the original water cooler. This brings us to the Livingstons and Robert Livingston and his son, Chancellor Livingston, if you allow me to talk about them for a moment. 
As we said, uh, Robert's father had told Queen Anne to send the Palatine Germans up to put them in the work camps. And even though that didn't work out, they were still very powerful. And they were given what was called the Hardenburg Tract. I'm in a room full of historians. I don't need to tell you that. But it included the Catskills. It also included the other side of the river, Claremont, and areas like Kingston. Robert Livingston would start a gunpowder factory uh, using barrels, and it helped us win the, the Revolutionary War. Uh, England had cut us off from saltpeter, and we were not able to make our own gunpowder. There's a gunpowder barrel there. Gunpowder would be kept on boats and small barrels like this. Uh, on the, during the war, they would usually have a leather flap over the end of the barrel. That was to keep the sparks out as one man ran around helping load the cannon fire. This is Chancellor Livingston. He inherits his grandfather and his father's land. And they open a large sawmill not too far from here. The Dutch had already had one. That sawmill grows, and they see what a big industry they have in the timber that's coming out of the Catskills. The Glasgow Glass Company comes nearby because they need birch for their forges. And Chancellor Livingston has a very large cooperage. The town that built up around this industry is known as Woodstock. And his cooperage sat on the lake that supplies Kingston water that we know as Cooper's Lake. There it is there. Uh, there was a large cooperage right there. Livingston's a fascinating character. He's one of the five people that writes the Declaration of Independence. When Franklin gets ill, they send him to France to broker the Louisiana Purchase, which he does. While he's there, he meets a young inventor by the name of Robert Fulton, who told him he can get his goods up and down the Hudson a lot quicker. And the two of them start uh, a steamboat company. They build it right there in Claremont, named the first boat after Claremont from his ancestral home. And for 18 years, Livingston and Fulton run not only a monopoly on the Hudson, but because he brokered Louisiana Purchase, he gave himself the only access to the Mississippi Delta. And for 18 years, the two of them ran the Hudson River and the Mississippi. You could not have a steamboat on either if it wasn't one of theirs. Our, 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 our anti-monopoly laws were written just to break up uh, this monopoly of these two men. Some of the things that have been going up and down the Hudson was salted meat and fish. They were pulling sturgeon out of the water. I believe they call that Albany beef. Oh, you told me that, Bill. Yeah. They would pack the barrels with salt. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of food industry has obviously relied on the barrel. This is the tallow industry, which is a rendered animal fat that was used. Uh, these are some great tanks from Austria. You can see the men there mixing sauerkraut. I know that looks photoshopped, but I've actually talked to someone in Austria on Instagram, and they are real. The balsamic vinegar industry relies heavily on barrels, especially barrels of different woods, and while the, the vinegar is refined as it goes through the different types. There's some barrels of olive oil in Portugal. These are flour barrels on the Erie Canal, just like the D&H Canal and the Erie Canal. They were moving a lot of barrels, especially what we talked about earlier, slack barrels. You can see here the bundle of staves that they had. Most cooperages were assembly plants. The staves were being milled somewhere else. Um, and you can see them making slack flour barrels there. These barrels were paper lined. This is a slack stave cutter. This is a rotating saw, and as the wood was moved in, it would cut almost a curved shingle off. The wood would go over, and they would keep passing it through that blade to cut those. Uh, these are some examples of some flower barrels. John Alden, remember his name earlier from the first Cooper. In Minneapolis, they're making about 10 million barrels by 1894. John distinction? Uh Yeah, so I make uh, wet, yeah, they're slack barrels. It's much thinner. I have some pictures, and there's actually some here. They're very thin, and they used everything from nails, pelts, glass, uh, flour, uh, the Rosendale cement. These were all in slack barrels. They were thin because they didn't need to be as strong? They didn't need to be as strong. It was really just a vessel to hold it. Uh, they didn't have sheet goods at the time. Right. Uh, to make boxes. But before we go there, um, these were also bound with wooden hoops. There used to be one here. And those wooden hoops were made by local people, especially here, called hoopers. 
They were farmers, and during the summer, the, all these hills had been denuded, and the saplings that grew, they would cut them and slide them down the mountains into lakes, and during the winter, they would make hoops. They would use a draw knife like this on a draw bench and split the saplings and make hoops. They would take them to towns like Rosendale Cement, a large patrician company that was making cement. Rosendale Cement did not want to be in the barrel making business, so the hoopers would come and barter for goods and services using the hoops there in Rosendale. Records show in 1881 alone, 45 million wooden hoops were made in this area. Then they strike oil in Titusville in 1856, and the minute they do that, they need a lot of barrels. There's nothing else to put this oil in. They need barrels and tanks. Here's an oil field. I believe this is in uh, Pennsylvania. You can see these large tanks here filled with oil. This is a very messy and dangerous thing to do. These tanks would often catch on fire. And it could be very hard to get water to extinguish those. Does anybody have any idea how you would put out a burning tank of oil? Huh? <laughs> Remember, this is America. There's a hint. <laughs> they would shoot at them. <laughs> they had cannons around the oil fields. If one of the tanks would catch on fire, the cannon was aimed and would blast a hole in the bottom of the tank, draining the tank and eventually extinguishing the fire. <laughs> this brings us to John D. Rockefeller. He not only wanted to make all the oil, but he wanted to make all the barrels. We talked about before how there was a problem. He standardized the barrel size at 42 gallons. They call it the American Standard Barrel. And Rockefeller uh, is running the largest cooperage in the Ohio Valley with many other cooperages around it. This is the Stevens and Heisman Cooperage. Uh, many industries grew up around this petroleum. We have uh, um, paint and glues. Uh, PPG, Pittsburgh Paint, uh, is there in that area. So there's a huge need for barrels and cooperage. Uh, if you recognize that name, Heisman, you might know it if you play football, the Heisman Trophy. That was named after John Heisman, right? Um, and that is him right here. That's Heisman's son, Johnny, would go on to a football career, and you can almost imagine him holding a small barrel as he's running. <laughs> this is Matthew Vassar. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the industries without getting too much into them, like the beer industry. Uh, Matthew Vassar and his brother have a large brewery over in Wappingers Falls. They're making and selling 50,000 barrels a year going down the Hudson. These breweries would have large tanks such as these for storage vats. They would also be cooling the beer here. That's an ice house above the barrels and tanks. Uh, you see all the ice and below it are the tanks keeping it cool. This is a shot from the Guinness Brewery. The French wine industry obviously relies heavily on the barrel. And then we talked about the ton. Uh, this picture shows both metal hoops and wooden hoops that were being used there. In fact, if you go to some vineyards today, you still see them using the wooden hoops, and they use that for a reason. The wooden hoops still have organic matter in them, and they attract the bugs to keep them away from the sugar that's coming out of the bunghole and heads. It's a way to distract them. Uh, if anybody has ever lived in England and had a pickup truck, uh, you know that the back there is called the tonneau, and that's a tonneau cover. Tuneau is French for barrel, and the reason it's called the Tuneau cover is because the early cars, the back seats were just scooped out barrels that they would put on top of the frame. Obviously, the whiskey industry relies heavily on the barrel. Uh, currently, there are 7.5 million barrels just in Kentucky. Brings us to Rosendale Cement and the cement industry. We talked about before about the hoopers. Each of these barrels would go down to the city with anywhere between six and 12 hoops on them. It was a paper lined barrel. The barrel would be chopped up when it got down there and just burned. Uh, but the men would get about 10 cents a barrel. Bill, I believe this is from the museum. Do you remember where this picture is from, Bill? Florenceville. Florenceville, uh huh. Uh, if you've ever been to East Kingston or the Ponchaki area, uh, that was also another patrician uh, cement town. Uh, there's an old headline saying, the staves are coming. Now, the men will be back at work. Uh, they can make cement all day long, but without the barrels to put them in, uh, they couldn't ship anything. 
Uh, this is not too far from where I grew up in Philadelphia. Uh, if you've ever been to Philadelphia, this is a shot from Penn's Landing. That's the Theodore Apple Cooperage. They weren't just cooperage, they were gaugers too. And the gaugers were measuring the barrel size and, and what was inside of it uh, for excise taxes and tariffs. And it was a large industry. As we said, it was very hard to determine how big this barrel is and how much was in it. Here's some barrels from uh, the museum. Uh, you can see here with the wooden slats. You can see them tapered and pinned here with a nail. The nail would be bent over to hold it. And there, these saplings were fresh and wet. And as they shrunk, they constricted and tightened the barrel even more. It was a big business at the turn of the century. Uh, here's an ad for the Quaker City Cooperage uh, for slack barrels. Uh, they're looking for wood and stave material. I have a huge book of just ad after ad of this. The cooperage industry not only made barrels and tanks, but it made cooperage making machinery. Uh, this here is the slack joiner. In order to prove that the inventive genius of the American people has not yet reached the limits of its possibility, we present the Rochester slack barrel stave jointer. Terribly dangerous looking machine. This brings us to Ann Tyler Edison. I'd like to talk to, about her for a moment. In 1904, there was a World's Fair up in Buffalo, and daredevil and stunts were quite popular at the time. And a 42-year-old woman decided to go over the falls in a barrel of her own making. Uh, no one had ever done it before. She designed this barrel here with a weight on the bottom and a pillow. <laughs> Here we see Anne here. Anne lied about her age. She was actually 62. <laughs> this is the shot of the two psychopaths who nailed her into that barrel. <laughs> One can only imagine over the deafening noise of the fall, yelling, Anne, it's time to go. And they pushed her over the falls. Uh, as we said, it was just Anne and a pillow. But Anne had one other thing in the barrel. If you were going to go over the barrel in the falls, uh, what would you put in the barrel? Do you have any ideas what you'd put in the barrel with you? Bottle of, scotch. bottle of scotch, some rum. No, she put a cat in there with her. She went over the falls with a cat. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> uh, Anne survived the trip over the falls. This is the actual barrel that she would tour with. Later, her manager stole it from her. Uh, but that, her and the cat. Uh, many people did it after Anne. Some lived, uh, some didn't. But she was the first. We start to see the fall of the barrel during the Industrial Revolution. If you've ever been to the Dumbo neighborhood in Brooklyn, it was called the Robert Gare Company. They did not invent corrugated cardboard, but they propagated it through the states. Prohibition did not help the Coopers either. <laughs> This is Nellie Bly. Some of you might heard she was a famous muckraker. Uh, she committed herself into an asylum for a few days and wrote about it. I, the name of the book escapes me at the moment. But she later on became an industrialist. And in a final death knell to the barrel, she patented the steel drum. Uh, that, I'm going to talk now about my process and how I, I make the barrel. Um, my company is called Quercus. As I said, I'm a cooper. Did I say that I, as I'm 5'6", I'm known as a mini cooper. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, name of my company is Quercus. That's Latin for oak. Quercus alba, white oak. Quercus roja, red oak. The problem with making a barrel is that the pore structure of the wood is such that if I just cut flat sawn wood, the water would leach right out of the barrel. By cutting the wood at quarter sawn, I'm putting the pores on a tangent across the front of the stave. In white oak, you've seen this before in arts and crafts furniture. These are called medullary rays. White oak is about 38% medullary ray. And in those rays are something called tyloses. They're small tissue-like, almost balloons. And in the same way our arteries get clogged, as the tree grows, the tyloses swells and stops the water from moving uh, through the pores. And that's why white oak is the main wood used for barrels. You're not going to see really a mahogany barrel, God bless you, or a birch barrel. It's white oak because of the high content of tyloses. You can see here is one of my staves. Now, it looks like the grain is going this way, but this is actually the grain running here. 
You can see it's across the front. If the grain was there, the liquid would just leach straight from the barrel. I mill my staves here. We talked about that mathematical process before. Uh, my barrel stave, like that one there, is 25 staves. 25 into 360 divided by 2 gives me my angle. This stave here has a bilge in the middle, as you can see. It goes from about 2 inches to 3 back to 2. And you can see this here in the barrel. It gives this barrel its bilge here in the middle. This is a tank here that I make, and we saw them there in the water towers and the pipes and the silos. This is straight. If we can imagine an American football and unstitch it, what we have are four pieces of leather. And that leather is almost like a wide diamond. And as we stitch that leather together, we start to get a shape that resembles a barrel. In fact, if this continued, it would almost look like a football. If I took those same four pieces of leather and they were rectangles and stitched them together, I would have a tube or a tank. So to get a straight tank, I put no bilge in the stave, but for a barrel, I do put the bilge. The bilge is very important. We talked about nautical commerce and trade. One man or woman could roll a 900 pound barrel on the bilge, pivot the barrel, roll it up some planks onto a boat. It was very easy to move. A 900 pound crate is much harder for people to move and lift around, especially without sheet goods or large rift wood. So the barrel was able to move around very easily. This is my bunghole reamer. We talked about the Mayflower and John Alden. Uh, to access water or food, which is what the cooper did on the boat, he needed to be able to get into the barrel and be able to close it back up again. That boat was filthy and disgusting. And if he just dug a hole into the barrel, all that filth would go into it. This shaft allows me to taper the bunghole while the dirt and wood that's coming up into this shaft, stopping it from going into the barrel. Once I've raised the barrel here into what the French call the mise en rose, I'm creating a barrel, I need to now steam it. One of the hard parts of opening a cooperage is not only it has to be quarter sawn white oak, but it has to be air dried white oak. The wood that I use, like for this barrel, was dried outside for three years. This brought the moisture content down uh, without any cracking and allowed some of the tannins to get flushed out of the wood. If I made a barrel out of new oak, it would be completely astringent, like making tea with 10 tea bags. So we air dry it. And the wood, if you can imagine wood as a bundle of straws, and those bundles of straws are held together with a gelatinous material called lignin. It's why when you take a new branch and try to snap it, you can't. The lignin is soft and allows the wood to move. If I bought wood that I would use as a cabinet maker, uh, it would be kiln dried. That would have gone into a kiln and dried at 600 degrees, crystallizing that lignin. That's why your table doesn't warp. That's why the door doesn't cup, because it's been in kiln. I'm talking to some woodworkers here, <laughs> not to look at them. Yes. <laughs> but if it's only been air dried, that lignin hasn't been crystallized and allows me to bend the wood. And I do that by steaming the barrel. For about 45 minutes, wetting the wood, I steam it, loosening the lignin, allowing me to bend the wood. Uh, this is a gentleman at the Guinness plant. He's steaming the wood with a steam bell. A nice tweed suit. <laughs> Once that is done, I am able to bend the wood. We talked about stitching that football together. So if I start with that mise en rose shape and come in and pull it together, just like stitching the football, I will get a symmetrical shape. Right? You can see here, these are my working hoops. As you can see on this barrel, this has barrel rings on it. But when I'm making my barrel, I'm using these thick, tapered working hoops. Here's one of the rings here. When the hoops come off, I put the ring on. This ring has a cant to it, an angle. It's actually a conical section. Uh, this is bent along with my working hoops, allowing it to sit nicely on the wood. Once this is done, I'm ready to toast the barrel. My clients who are whiskey makers want the barrel toasted and charred, so I toast the barrel. Two things are happening. I'm toasting and I'm setting the lignin. I'm hardening the lignin in the barrel so that the stave stays curved. But I'm also toasting the sugar. We talked about those straws. They're filled with cellulose and hemicellulose sugars. 
and by toasting that, I'm adding some sugar profiles to what will go in there later. I then char the barrel. I introduce 1300 degrees in the barrel using compressed air, creating a cyclone of fire in the barrel. This gives me a charred interior. My clients ask me for a light char or dark char, and this is why your whiskey is brown. The whiskey is moonshine. When it goes in, it's clear, and my charred interior is what gives it its flavor and its taste. If you can imagine toasting a marshmallow, that first pass gets you that yellow, nice color. That's the toasted aspect, and if you take that marshmallow and then char it, you get that nice black coating on the outside. We're doing the same to the interior of the barrel. Now the tricky part. This is the chime and the crows, and this is where the head sits into the barrel stave. If I have a water balloon and I poke a hole in that balloon, all the water comes out of that balloon. If that same pinhole is in my barrel, all the liquid will come out. So it's very important to get this cut right. You can see there. With the help of some of the woodworkers in this room, I modernized some of my woodworking machinery that I had existing to help me cut the chime in the crows. And when my blades are sharp and everything is clean, it looks very tight, almost like one piece of wood. But you can see the difference in the staves there. I'm then ready to put the head into the barrel. I open up and take off those working hoops. As it opens up, I'm able to put the head into the barrel, and then I put my rings on it. This is a shot from my shop. These are barrels when they're done. This is at the Stout Ridge Vineyard and Distillery in Marlboro. He has over 300 of my barrels and some of my large tanks. You can see them here. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go down to Marlboro, check out Steve and Stout Ridge Vineyard. It's really wonderful. I also make large tanks called washbacks. Uh, this is what they ferment their wort in. And as we talked about and saw before, uh, these large tanks. Here's my hoop with my lugs. This is Douglas fir. This is a neutral wood as opposed to the oak, which introduces tannins and sugars. The fir is neutral and allows them to create their own biome in there to ferment in. I have them all over. These are in Detroit. We have a bunch in Seattle and New Jersey and Philly. And you can see him there stirring the wort. Uh, when the pandemic hit, my distillers stopped distilling. They started making hand sanitizer. <laughs> I tried to get, as hard as I could, I tried to get them to age that in barrels, but they wouldn't do it. <laughs> uh, so I took the same technology and thought process and we started making uh, wooden hot tubs here in the area. Come by the shop, you never know who you might see up there. your camera, Bill That's Bill. And uh, one of the reasons I got into this was because the American distiller is federally mandated to use new charred oak barrels. In 1933, the Cooper's Union lobbied Congress, and they, while they were standardizing whiskeys, there's nine whiskeys you're legally allowed to make here in the U.S., and six of them must be aged in a new charred oak barrel. When I got into this in 2015, it's because there was a barrel crisis. Where were you? for the barrel crisis. <laughs> I read an article in Times Magazine. Most of you are old enough here to remember that. It was a magazine, and, uh, and it was an article about the barrel shortage and what was going on in Kentucky, where they were making most of the barrels. They were ignoring what was happening here in New York and in Washington with the craft whiskey movement. Those people, just like Jack Daniels, were federally mandated for new barrels. And when I got in, there was a two-year wait for barrels. So if you opened a distillery, you were going to have to wait two years to get barrels to store it in. Uh, that eventually calmed down, but now with the pandemic, we're back in a barrel crisis again. It's affecting not only the American whiskey industry, uh, but the American wine industry. Uh, there's a large shortage of cooperages and coopers. I'm one of 28 cooperages left in America. And I'm one of only three that make them by hand. Most of them are automated, with the largest one making 2,400 barrels a day. There's three shifts. Each shift makes 800 barrels. And uh, so it's big business in Kentucky, as we said. Um, you can find out more about me online on Instagram or uh, uh, at Quercus Cooperage. And I wanted to open up for questions. If anybody had any questions, yes, ma'am? couple of things. Sure. How do you get your oak? Uh -huh. And would you talk about how you became a cooper from your earlier history? Oh, yeah, I skipped that. Yeah, so um, I started woodworking as a teenager in South Philadelphia. I met people like Michael uh, over here. 
And I was doing it for about 25, 26 years. I had a shop with Josh Finn up here on the hill. I mean, you know Josh. And, uh, but it was a lot of chemicals, and I was sick of uh, the chemicals. Um, so when I learned that there was a barrel crisis, I bought a few barrels and took them apart, try to reverse engineer it, and try to figure out the codex of why this was like this. And um, uh, like I said, my meddling woodworking friends helped me. And after two years of research and development, I held water for the first time. Uh, Steve at Stout Ridge wanted to use my barrels. He wanted something unique. And my wood is local. Uh, I get most of it from Tri-State that you drive by there on 209. I also work with a stave mill in Pennsylvania. Uh, because it's quarter sawn, many of you have seen people milling wood and they do it like this with a large slab. That's a flat cut and I can't use that wood. I need the wood to be cut quarter sawn. It's a very different way to set up to saw the wood. And these stave mills can cut a tree down to just a toothpick left of quarter sawn wood. And they supply uh, industries like myself. Yeah. And how long does it take you to make a barrel? Yeah, everybody asks me this, I know. Yeah. Uh, well, with my machinery in my shop, I can make about five barrels a week. If I had better machinery and better things, but, uh, and that's fine. I don't want to become a barrel factory. I like my spot. I am like a traditional cooperage. You can come get tanks from me. Uh, when the pandemic hit, I switched into the culinary work. These are fermenting tanks for shoyu and soy sauce. Uh, I make things based around koji, if anybody that. It's a fermented rice. So I'm able to pivot uh, with the hot tubs and the culinary and the barrel instead of just making 30 whiskey barrels a week. And because because my competitors are only making whiskey barrels, it gives me a nice lane to do custom work. People call me from anything from beer folders. I have someone in the, uh, Nova Scotia who uses them for pickled herring. Um, I make a cabinet that I've sent all over the world, to Austria, to uh, Australia. We just sent one to the Sultanate of Oman. Um, so it allows me, to, I, I like the lane that I'm in where I'm not just cranking out whiskey barrels. Yeah. Yes, sir. Your picture showed a traditional versus a modern quarter sewing. Yes. What's the difference in... Why, did, why was it changed? Oh, yeah. So, um, well, traditionally, it, uh, it was cut in a very even manner. But when they do a quarter saw, on there, I'm getting slabs that are anywhere between three inches and an inch and a half. So I'm getting varieties of, of width. And if you notice on the barrel, there are some wider staves. There are some smaller staves. And it's just a more efficient way to cut the log quarter sawn, as opposed to trying to get uniform staves every time. It gives me a lot of waste. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am? Do you shape the angles and the, the bulge? Oh, yes. I have machinery that does both at the same time. It shapes the angle. And I have a machine that cuts the staves and it follows a pattern. Uh, I can make any pattern I want. Uh, this one comes out with the bilge and comes back in and cuts the angle on the edge of the stave there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I can direct that angle depending on that. Yes, Michael? That barrel there. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. I uh, know it looks like that because of the ring, but it, it, it does have a. a, a no, I understand that. Yeah. But I mean, is there a function of producing a barrel like that? Uh, y yes. Um, when we saw with the silos and the hoops, those can be tightened manually because it's a flat tank. Where the barrel, the bilge gives us another advantage and then I can bang the hoops down against the bilge. It acts as a clamp, squeezing this together and actually squeezing the head together. On some of those large tanks you saw, they were tapered to the bottom so the stave would be thin and then get thicker. And this allows us to tighten the rings by hammering as opposed to manual tightening on a tank or a silo. Yes, sir? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering, like, with white oak, yeah. does it matter how long white oak is sitting around as far as whether it's going to be usable for a barrel? Uh, yes, yeah, some cooperages use five year aged. Um, it's really washed a lot of the tannins out, and I think to me it's a little bit dead. I think three years is a nice sweet spot. Um, but yes, you could make a barrel out of older oak. But it's just, for my clients, they're trying to get a flavor imparted. Um, and the three year is a nice spot for the sugars. Yeah. And one thing that I'm seeing, like when my parents lived down in Maryland, is there's a lot of, a lot of oak trees dying from the climate issue down there and yeah. the drought and such. Yeah. And I'm seeing so many of these things just standing dead and rotting and turning into firewood. And I'm like, that doesn't seem right to do with white oak. 
Yeah, you know, the, uh, the way we uh, harvest timber in this country is, is very much scattered and scavenger-like as opposed to in France where they auction off the forests every year. Uh, Napoleon and the Secretary of the Navy realized they needed oak for warships, so they cordoned off the forest into different regions, and every year you bid at auction for a portion of that forest. Where here in America, it's mostly a uh, public land that people are, are scavenging from. Yeah. You know, um, <clears throat> so the woodworking industry and the coopering industry uh, get about 15% of the annual oak that is milled and harvested. Can anybody uh, know what the other 85% goes to? What, uh, white oak, 85% of the white oak that's harvested annually goes to make one product. And I'll give you a hint. Everything in your house has been on this product. Balance. Yes. Hey, nobody ever gets pallets. You're going to get a free barrel. 85% of the annual oak that is milled, uh, mostly because it's knotted, uh, is used for pallets. Uh, the woodworking industry, the flooring industry, and the coopering industry uh, gets the, the sweeter wood without uh, any of the imperfections. Yes, sir. Uh, this is Douglas fir. You might know that wood from two by fours. Uh, this is called clear fir. Uh, there's no knots, and, no, and this is a traditional fermenting barrel. If you've ever been to Scotland and saw their large tanks, uh, they're using Douglas fir. As I talked about before, it's neutral, so this has a lot of tannins that introduce a lot of flavor to your beer, to your whiskey. When they're fermenting, say, a soy sauce or even a pickled herring, they don't want the introduction of all those tannins into the flavor profile. So this gives them a neutral biome. Yeah, it's also, cypress is also commonly used, but we don't have too much of it around here. So I can get this fur really nice locally. Yeah? Do you only use Quercus alba, or do you use other species of white oak also? I only use Quercus alba. I can't use red oak because it doesn't have the tyloses content. I could use French oak, but I don't have access to it. Uh, there's also a Japanese oak that has a lot of leaking issues and that is very desirable. But for what I can get here in America, it is white oak. When they came over here and found our white oak in the forest here, they found that they could saw the wood. In France, they still split. French white oak can only be split, uh, but here they like the American white oak because it actually can be sawn. Can you use chestnut No. And this is an issue because um, I can't get wood I, from certain people who are telling me they're giving me oak are gonna give me about 10% chestnut oak. I can't identify that when it comes in. I can only identify it when my client calls me and says, this stave's leaking. <laughs> and it's leaking because I put a chestnut oak stave in there. So I have to be really careful of where I'm getting the wood and then not use chestnut oak. Yeah, yes? I got two, you two questions. Do I understand correctly that in order to put the top on it, you pop a ring off and then it opens up enough for you to... Yes, yeah, I used to have a slide, it didn't happen. Yeah, so when the working hoop comes up, it splays open just enough for us to tap our head in. And would that happen to a, to a, to a uh, barrel that's already aged, like that one that has enough spring in it? That it a little bit, you really have to loosen all the rings for them to open up like that. But for the newer construction... In, in sections, or is it a singular piece that you've already got as a perfect circle? Oh, no, the top starts as a square blank, um, and then I cut it into a circle. And the heads and the barrels, I use uh, shaper machines. Uh, this is very dangerous to put wood into a shaper. I'm introducing 25 unglued pieces of wood into the shaper. Uh, the head has eight pieces that are all unglued. That shaper doesn't want me to introduce anything to it, let alone unglued wood. Um, so I built a series of jigs and steel holders. I also have machines that give me a lot of pneumatic press to hold it down. Uh, while I cut it. Yeah. Okay, and finally, um, is there anything about swelling? Do you have to you know, yes. fill it with water to swell? Absolutely. To swell them? Uh, yes, I, all my clients know to swell the barrel for 48 hours. Um, the barrel is designed to be wet, it's designed to have liquid in it. Once it doesn't, so this has a high moisture content, this wood. It's probably about 20% to 18%, uh, where furniture makers are around what, 12, 13? percent a little lower 
This wood will try to get down to 12 if it dries out. When that happens, these rings start to slide off. It's almost as if you lost a lot of weight and your pants fall down. This makes the barrel very uneasy and very hard to sort of move around. So it's important once they get the barrel to fill it and keep it swelled. I'm relying on the swelling to keep my rings tight. Just like the boat builder who's relying on the external pressure of the boat, I'm relying on it on the inside. The boat builders keep the water out and we, the coopers, hold the water in. Oh, I am. Oh, I make the metal bands, so I get steel on a roll. My nicest machine in the shop is a Slovenian hoop roller. Um, and uh, it has a, it has, what's that? <laughs> yeah. Like our, like uh, our poor ex first lady, uh, the Slovenian ring roll. Uh, it rolls the rings and it puts a curve onto it. It was a great day, wasn't it? Um, it was a, uh, it puts this cant on it. It rolls the steel not only into the circle, but onto this, uh, to our measurements. We then punch two holes. Uh, we take another measurement and then we actually bang the rivets by hand. And when I say we, I mean my assistant, Santiago. Uh, we bang these rivets here and flatten them. It's soft annealed steel. Uh, and we make all of our rings ourselves. Uh, here, you can see the rivets here on my tank. Yeah. Did you also say the stays, they vary in width? Yeah, so when I get quarter sawn lumber, I can get anything from five inches all the way to an inch and a quarter. So I, I have a, a recipe. So my working hoop is a specific circumference. Let's just say it's 56 inches. Now, I know that I need 25 staves because of the mathematical formula of my angle. So now I need 25 staves that add up into that circumference. So I have different recipes. I have four different stave sizes, A, B, C, and D. And uh, if I have three A's and 10 B's and a couple C's, I know that I can get that. And then I can vary my recipe if I have a lot of smaller staves or larger staves. We always have one large stave and that's our bung stave. That's where the, the bung hole will be. This one doesn't have a bung. It's also, if you look at a barrel, it's also where the rivets are. That bung stave has been compromised by me putting a hole in it. Uh, so we place our rivets there. But so we have different ways to do that. There was one Cooper who was only using the same size wood, but he got a, a, a huge amount of waste and it can be very inefficient. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. You've been using the term bilge. I know there's a bilge of a boat as the whole. Uh huh. I would have called that a bulge. Right. It probably was originally the bulge, but yeah, we do call it the bilge. This is the bilge, this is the bulge. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Yes. I was just wondering how, how long the wooden parts or the sugars into the flavor of the. Oh, yes. How long does that last? Years and years? No. Uh, so, my 30 gallon barrel will mature whiskey after two years. Uh, after that, it can be reused, uh, but the sugar content is much lower. Um, as I said before, here in America, we're federally mandated to use new oak. In Scotland, they're federally mandated to use used barrels. If I sent a Scottish man one of my new barrels, he wouldn't be able to call it Scotch whiskey. Uh, but do you trade off the barrels at that point? Like our secondary market, most of the barrels go to Scotland and uh, Ireland. Those Guinness barrels there that we saw stacked up, uh, they were stacked up there because that's basically a lumber yard. They're going to take one of those barrels, they're going to knock it down, they're going to cut the tops of the staves off and remake the barrel and remake the staves. Yeah. Yes, sir. How long does the uh, charring process take? Uh, anywhere between 30 and 45 seconds. Uh, once I get the flames coming out and it's very loud and deafening, I start a counting process and then I stop. So 30 seconds gives me a char one, 45 seconds gives me a char three with a little bit of crackle, and then some people really want it charred and then we really go for it. Yeah. Yeah. How uh, <laughs> We have cannons aimed at the workshop. They're up in the Schwangunk Ridge. I yell, fire! And then they come down, and then the fire goes out. Uh, no, I'm actually able to... It's an interesting thing, because when I'm charring and I've created a cyclone of fire in the barrel, I haven't really set the barrel on fire. I've just introduced it to this flaming uh, tornado. So once I cut the air off, uh, the barrel is extinguished pretty quickly. The wood never is really on fire. It's just next to the fire. Yeah. Is that what fuel you're using? What's that? What fuel you're using? 
Yeah, so I use, um, I use cutoffs mostly from the fur. This has been kiln dried, I don't have to bend it. Uh, and that's much drier. My oak is very wet, so it's sometimes hard for me to get a fire going. But we start a small fire, and then I have a long extension that goes onto my air hose, otherwise I burn my fingers. And it's very hot, it's about 1300 degrees. And, uh, and it's wonderful, you guys ever come to the shop and see us do it, you put your head right in there afterwards and you smell like you're in a bakery. Mm -hmm. And you can feel the tannins needling up into your nose. Like you would think it would smell like something burned or, or, or resinous, but it, it has a beautiful, sweet, bread-like smell. And you can actually feel the blister starting to... Yeah, yeah, uh-huh, oh yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. Where yeah. Is college after that? Huh? Is college after that? Oh yeah, all the time. <laughs> Yes, sir. How do you monitor and control the moisture content in your stock wood? Oh, yeah. Well, um, I don't put heat on in my shop. It's a very cold shop because uh, I don't want it to dry out. Um, and we have moisture readers. We have these little yeah. things uh, that can read the moisture. Um, when I'm getting wood from the place in Pennsylvania, it's been three year air dried. Uh, they do give me an average listing of the moisture content that I can check. Yeah, but I have had to wait some wood. We bring it into the house usually for about two or three weeks and let it uh, get dried. But usually I like to be at like 19%. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Do you put the bottom in the same way you put the yeah, they're both the same. In fact, uh, Ben Franklin called New Jersey a barrel that had been bunged at both ends. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yes, but they're completely symmetrical. Uh, yeah, the head on this, they call them heads. Uh, there's no top or bottom necessarily, uh, just a barrel head. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir? Where's your shop? Um, in the Mohonk Arts Building, where the water tower is. Uh, right up here. You've driven by it a million times. Uh, Sydney Reese's old place and Brenda and Sydney's old place. We haven't been that uh, So we're right up the hill. <laughs> I can roll a barrel right down here. To, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. John, you mentioned yeah. something as trivial as mixing chestnut oak to create a leak. Oh, yeah. And this is with all your technology and your precision machinery. Yeah. When you look at pictures like in the 1300s, 1400s, yeah. loading things onto ships. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How the heck do those things, how can they make those things watertight? And last, because they don't have anywhere near your capability yet. Oh, but they they were for months at a time, and these barrels are supposed to hold liquid for that long without leaking. Yeah, I mean, I talked about the formula, which is rudimentary, and a lot of coopering is rather rudimentary. And like with any trade, if you start at 16 and do it every day for 30 years, you get very good at it and uh, and be able to pass it down. They would cut these staves with a large axe. Uh, they would do axe work. They didn't have any automated machines like I do. Uh, they were just very skilled at what they do, the same way uh, they built bridges and arches and churches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just something that you did every day, and uh, you just made staves, and you get pretty good at it. There's different markers and gauges they could use, an eyeball, the angle, and stuff. Uh, there's also a large, what's called the Cooper's plane. Uh, I, I brought some planes everybody wants look, this is called the sun plane. Uh, this plane was used to level off the top of the barrel. Uh, coopering is very interesting because it has really its own set of tools. If I built you a table or a chair or, or a home or a barn, I'd really be using the same sort of woodworking tools. Uh, but coopering has its own set. Uh, one of the ways I learned how to do this was I bought a collection of tools that was being uh, auctioned off. It was from a museum in Ottawa that was deassessing their collection. And I had a large collection of 18th and 19th century hand tools. Uh, this is a crozing plane here. You can see this V groove right here, maybe. And the, they would take this and cut into the oak to get the groove and the chime and the crows that we talked about there. I'll go back to that. That was done with planes like this. So I bought a large collection that had every sort of tool that was used through the coopering process. So between this, reverse engineering the barrel, and then setting up the mid-century furniture making machinery and shapers we had in the shop, I was able to get my shaper to do what this did. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yes. With all the barrels that can only be used once, yeah. like a whiskey, yeah. and the whatever hundreds of millions of barrels have been made just in the last century. Yeah. Uh, well, they go to Scotland, mostly, uh, that doesn't have any more virgin oak forests. 
Um, they get chopped in half and sold at Adams for planters. You, you do see a, a large now. There's uh, you know there's barrel tequila and barrel coffee, so there are a lot out there. But they mostly go overseas and used as just millable lumber to make new barrels with. Uh, no, not if it's kept well. Uh, you're going to lose the sugar content, but um, there's a nun in Vermont who makes cheese out of a barrel she's had for like 50 years, Sister Noel. She somehow was the only person who could convince the Board of Health that, uh, that she could make cheese in it. But our ancestors used this for everything. Yes, Mike? But sherry and I think pork are second use. Yes, sherry and pork are second use. Yeah, they use those. Yeah, and there's a sherry cask, and there's something called an imitation sherry cask. Yeah, but they're, and again, they're getting the wood from us, uh, from our barrels, yeah. And they just reconstitute it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Charming the barrel before the advent of an air compressor, was it bellows used or something like that? Or? Bellows, yeah. And just, if I start a fire in here and sit long enough, it'll, it'll get rather hot. Uh, some people uh, put the barrel down like this and start a small fire and roll the barrel around, uh, yeah. Um, they, my clients tell me that my barrels taste better because I don't use propane. If you've ever seen a video with the flame shooting out of the barrel at Jack Daniels, uh, they're infusing it with propane. Now we grill on propane, but I always say that if you roast a marshmallow on a propane torch and roast it over the fire, you're going to taste the difference. So um, I've been told by my clients that I have a standalone flavor because of the lack of propane that I use and the residue that's left on the inside of the barrel. Would something like this cost me change? Oh, this tonight, right now, for you in the front row, we'll give it to you if it's your hand. My fermenting tanks are anywhere between two and three hundred. Um, I keep them small; they're easier to ship. This fits in a nice box. Uh, yeah, and you can find them on my website or my Instagram store. My barrels, um, I recently have raised the price. Uh, uh, my 30 gallon barrel is $375. 200 of that is material. So, um, yeah, that's why you have to make a lot of barrels to make money. I'm going to figure that out one day, though. I'm gonna... <laughs> I went from the lucrative trade of custom fabrication into the lucrative trade of coopering. Did I mention that I'm only one of 28 coopers? <laughs> yeah, so it, it's hard to make money. But that's why I like making the large tanks and just keeping it different separate as opposed to having to make 40 barrels a week just to make our numbers. And I chose not to go down that path. Yes? I noticed among all the uh, interesting names of the various size barrels, yes. mm -hmm. you had Hogshead. Can you explain for us whether circuses use them? Because in the for the benefit of Mr. Kite, uh -huh, very good. we have to run a Hogshead of real fire. Oh, yes. And in fact, when we meet Huckleberry Finn in the first chapter of the book, he's living in a hogshead barrel. I can't tell you why it's in the circus, but I do have a story about the hogshead. Um, from the barrel, we get many things, and one of them is the brand name or trademark. They would brand the head of the barrel with a rudimentary logo so they knew where the barrels were coming from. And legend has it that a bull's head would be on there. And in an English accent, when they saw that ox head, they said hogshead. And that that's where the term hogshead came from. I cannot verify that, but that's where. So I keep it out of the lecture. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's great names. A punchin, a ton, a firkin. Yeah, and I called my barrel a firkin and my 30-gallon a trenta. When I got into it, there was a backlash against small barrels, so I purposely didn't call it a 10-gallon or a 5-gallon. Uh, the, the good old boys in Kentucky did not like what was happening here, and what was happening is that places like Tuttletown was maturing in small barrels so they can get it to the market faster. Uh, that annoyed the Kentucky people, and a book came out called Why Small Barrels Are Ruining the Whiskey Industry. <laughs> so I picked Firkin instead of 5-gallon barrel. Yeah. You said huh? Do you sell to Tuttletown? Um, yes. Well, no, uh, but I am on uh, staff at Tuttletown. They, they were bought by Scottish overlords, and those overlords told them that they needed a cooper that they could call when they had a problem. I do a lot of repair work because of my background in woodworking. I'm able to repair barrels. Um, and I've, I've worked with some people who taught me some of the tricks on how to do that. So I will go and repair leaky barrels. Yeah, so I do work with Tuttletown, but they are owned by a large Scottish uh, corporation. But yeah. they still have to use. Huh? But they still have to use new material. 
Right, they use barrels from automated factories, yes. Um, but um, they, but um, it's one thing to buy the barrel. Uh, what Coopers did not only were to make the barrels, but they also repair and upkeep those barrels from getting liquid out of it to stopping the leaks. Yeah, and that's what I do also for Tuttletown. Yeah, I get free whiskey. Do you have apprentices? No, it, it, it's dangerous work. And um, I can't have people on there. I have an assistant who makes the rings and helps me mill. Uh, people have approached me for that. Um, but it is a tricky thing that I, I've had some younger people work with me. But um, no, I don't offer an apprentice program. Yeah, the shapers are very dangerous. So um, I have to be careful. I do, I have them all. I play the piano, so it helps, yeah. yeah. And, um, but in the olden days, I, there would have been a, a union, or in England, what are they called, liveries, that I could have gone to that had trained men ready to go. I met an old Irish cooper. Him and his six brothers were trained to be coopers. And he told me what they would do. They would send him down into dark barrel cellars, no lights, and he, could, he would tap on the barrels, and he could tell which ones were leaking. Oh, that one. They would pull that one out and they would fix it. Um, but no, just like many trades, like furniture making or upholstery or coopering, um, there's no longer anywhere to really learn it. Um, that's why it was so hard for me. I had people coming back. We were looking for things online. You, you couldn't find it. I can build an airplane. I can learn Russian. But you couldn't find anything out about the barrel. Now, one thing is it probably died during the Industrial Revolution. And nobody's like, hey, Pa, you should write a book on coopering. So nothing was ever really written down. It was handed down through generation to generation. Um, so there was no information. There's a little bit more online now. And I do post some things. But it's a very secret sort of alchemy uh, to it. Yeah, it was very hard. That's why I had to use these tools to teach me how to do it, uh, because there was nowhere to really, there wasn't even any of the books just as like barrel lore, like I was talking about, or, or different stories throughout the years, um, and anecdotes, but no real uh, way to do it. Yeah. And that, that's really dead now. Yeah, the trade is fairly, it's become completely automated, like most woodworking trades are. Yeah. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming, and thank you to the Dean H. Museum. Thank you.